Hey guys, Mr. Cutler here. I wanted to go over your AP Physics Electrostatics test review really quickly here. You can see that I've printed out and scanned a copy of the equation and constants table. And what you'll see highlighted here are the spots that I think are going to be most relevant to your test. So the first place I want you to take a look at is these prefixes. And you notice I've circled the prefixes down low. That's because one coulomb of charge is so large that we usually deal in uh, very small units. Newtons and joules you're very familiar with, as well as watts from our dealings with power. The new ones that we deal with today are coulombs, which is the size of a charge, volts, which is the size of your electric potential, and a farad, which you use in capacitors. A few constants to be aware of, some that we've dealt with already, is the proton mass and the electron mass. You're going to use these when you're trying to convert electric static forces into some type of a kinematics or acceleration problem. Other two ones that are introduced that are brand new is the vacuum permittivity and Coulomb's law constant, which is equivalent to the big G in gravitational field. Okay, here's a copy of the equations that are relevant to this test. Now I'm not going to go into any of them in very great detail because I'll be doing that throughout, but you might just want to check out your copy of the AP Physics uh, equation table and highlight these areas before your test. So the first type of thing I want to go over is the idea of what a charge is. Charges are objects that um, have either more or less or equal amounts of protons to electrons. So you can see here I have an object that has approximately equal amounts of protons and electrons so it would have a charge of zero. But if I were to rub a cloth on it, friction will cause some of the electrons to jump off into the cloth because the cloth has a greater affinity for those electrons. So some of these electrons move off and this cloth will end up having a negative charge and this charge here will end up having a positive charge. Now I just made up these values of one but it could be anything else. But what you'll notice is if there's one on, negative one on the cloth there's plus one on the charge because of the law of conservation of charge. It's also important to note that it's the electrons that are moving and not the protons. Another way that we can look at charge is to, uh, is to see how charge moves when an object doesn't lose its charge, instead it just rearranges it. So if I took that positively charged particle from the first problem and I brought it close to something else, what you'll notice is all the electrons on this rod will line up along the one wall. And it's the electrons that are moving again. And what this is, is this polarizes this rod. So once this rod is polarized, it now will act as if it's charged, even though the net charge on the pole stays the same. The last thing uh, that you saw in your concept and calculation problem was a conduction example. And so essentially here if I have a charge that is negative and a charge over here that's positive, if they come together, the electrons will flow from the first charge onto the second charge. And the net result will be two particles with equal charges. So even though Q1 and Q2 had drastically different charges before, they're the same afterwards. Okay, the first uh, real bit of math part that we get into is when we look at electrostatic forces on charges. And you remember this equation is very similar to the gravity equation, except we're replacing mass with charge and our constants different. But this is a general equation that you're going to use anytime you're looking for a force between charges. Now, what if there's multiple forces? 
Well, if there's multiple forces acting on a single charge, you still end up using the same equation, except this time you have to add them together. So you would, if you wanted to find all of the forces acting on charge Q1, you would need to find the force of 1, 2, and add it to the force of 1, 3. So the force of 1, 2 simply would be kq1 times q2 over r squared, and the force of 1, 3 would just be kq1 q3 over r squared. So this small subscript lettering is just representing which charge to use. You would add these together and you'd find the sum of charges on F1. So what if you're looking at multiple forces in two dimensions? It gets a little bit more complex here. And what you'll notice is to find the sum of forces on 1, what you'll need to do is to find the square root of the sum of forces in the X plus the sum of forces in the Y. Okay, so similar to a kinematics type of problem. And to find the, force, the sum of forces in the X, I would need to find the F12 in the X direction plus the F13 in the X direction. And to find the sum of forces in the Y, I would need to only look at the F12 force in the Y, not the F13, because there is no Y force. It's perfectly uh, parallel. Now, another problem that you might have seen is uh, in the concepts and calculations where you ended up with a perfect square that is not a perfect square but it should be and they all frequently give you this distance here but they were never given you what this distance is here and so the simple way to calculate that is to just know that is equal to square root of 2d now that's really easy to prove through Pythagorean theorem but uh, it's better to just memorize that and that way you can use that information and save yourself a bit of time so the next concept is electrical fields. You might remember that electrical fields point away from positive charges and point towards negative charges. And the reason that is has to do with the way that Franklin uh, pictured these concepts before we had an idea that it was the electrons that are moving. Electrical fields can be very complex when you have two charges close together. So you can get all sorts of bending. Um, You'll also notice that this is the type of example where if I put in another point charge in around this area, I'll have to definitely talk about the sum of forces in X and Y components. You also would probably know or remember that if you found a dipole essentially somewhere directly in the middle, that the only force acting on this one would be down because the right force and the left force are going to cancel each other out. So it's, the object's only going to move down till it gets into the middle. Okay, so we could also have uniform electrical fields. That's where we have a large plate uh, instead of a point charge that's causing your uh, electric field. And uh, we can talk about potential energy here really quickly. You'll remember that if something is located here, versus here, it will have a higher potential energy. And the reason it'll have a higher potential energy is because it has more to go before it gets to the bottom. So we can think about that very similar to a gravity situation. And the equation for that simply is the potential energy is the... Oh, sorry, no squared there is this equation. And then we also talked about something about electric potential. What if we want to know the potential energy, but we don't want to know what one of the charges is? We just want to say, irregardless of whatever charge we stick in here, I just want to know what the strength of the electric potential is. And so that is equal to the electric potential energy divided by Q. And we can rewrite that to be KQ over R. Okay, uh, we also talked a little bit about equipotential surfaces, and equipotential surfaces are when the point along an electric field is equal to another point along an electric field, and if we looked at where those points are, they would form nice, perfect circles. Okay, once again, if this is our case here, 
that we have a charge going away from a positive, once again, I'll just try and represent this particle will have more potential energy than this particle, okay? Because this guy has more uh, ways to go. And one of your problems was asking whether work was done positively or negatively. And in this case, if I go from here to here, I'm losing potential energy. So the work done is actually going to be negative. Last question deals with capacitors, and we dealt with this at the just very recently. And we know that a capacitor is essentially equal to a charge divided by the electric potential. And if we don't, if we're not given what that electric potential is, we can also use the permittivity constant and multiply that by the area of the capacitor divided by the distance. And so this would be a value for how big of a capacitance the capacitor has. You can remember that this is measured in a farad, named after Michael Faraday. And essentially what this is saying is if I have a big area, I have big capacitance. If I have a small distance between my plates, then I also have a big capacitance. We can also look at capacitance in potential energy terms. So if I look at my potential energy of a capacitor, I could find out that that's equal to one half C electric potential squared. Now, if I'm not giving my C, if I'm not given what my C value is, I could simply find the charge that's um, in there and the electric potential and put that equation in. So I'd end up with something like this. Okay. I wish you well on your test tomorrow, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or stop and by. I have all of the concepts and calculation questions completed and ready to answer any questions that you'd have. Wish you well.